Christ to love them. To love them. And you ask any Muslim, chances are nine out of ten when you say to them, how did you come to know Jesus Christ? They'll say, I watched the love of God in another Christian and said, that's what I really don't have. Two summers ago, my wife and I had the privilege of traveling to Oxford, England to study at the Ravi Zacharias Institute. That opportunity was one of the greatest experience, experiences we ever had. Ravi Zacharias is the president of Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. He hosts a weekly radio program entitled, Let My People Think. He powerfully mixes biblical teaching and Christian apologetics. Ravi has one of the greatest minds of our generation. He loves the Lord and he loves Southern Baptist. Would you join me in giving tonight a warm Southern Baptist welcome to Ravi Zacharias. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much and God bless you. You know, I was in the green room uh, listening to the beautiful music, but I'm still trying to figure out why they call green rooms when they are not even green. And so I figured out the answer to that and that is because those of us who are standing there feel very green and ill-equipped to come and do what we are supposed to do. The longer I am in the ministry, the less qualified I feel to talk to people about the challenge of the times, the winds that blow against the gospel, and all the challenges that we face. We've just come through a rather historic day in the news at least. I remember being in Seoul, Korea many times this year and most of the hotels have gas masks in their closets in the hotel guest rooms. And I have no idea how all of them are looking at this. I'm sure some with skeptical eyes, some with hopeful eyes, but whatever it is, it's been an incredible event that has taken place during the last 24 hours. Only time will tell its true worth and value. But as we gather here, we're really in some extremely challenging times for the gospel. I have been an itinerant for 46 years. Uh, my wife and I have been in ministry for therefore nearly five decades. I don't recall when the challenges were so stiff the hills were so steep and the headwinds so strong. But at the same time, I have never had a greater trust and hope in that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only answer for all of the maladies and predicaments that confront us. As G.K. Chesterton said, the problem with Christianity is not that it's been tried and found wanting, but that it's been found difficult and left untried. And so as I step behind this lectern here, I want to first of all offer my heartfelt congratulations to J.D. Greer and an assurance of my prayer for him as he will need immense wisdom and courage and sensitivity to the Holy Spirit as he leads this great group of believers. So Dr. Greer, you have my prayers, you have uh, my support in all of these things as you face a tough road ahead, just as every Christian leader does in our time. You know, the Irish, my wife is half Irish and half Scottish, and uh, they have a very convoluted way of saying things. Everywhere else in the world, they will say to you, how are you, or how do you do? In Hindi, it's kya hal hai, what's the word, what's, what's the news? Uh, in the Irish, they will always look at you and say, is that yourself? 
and you want to look over your shoulder and say, am I to look for somebody else? Yes, this is myself. But the story is told of this man who was driving on the uh, farmland area and uh, got lost in one of these beautiful towns of Northern Ireland. And as he was trying to make his way back, he saw a farmer plowing. And he went over to him and asked him for directions for where he was headed. And the farmer just looked at him and said, my friend, if that's where you are going, this is not where I would begin. If that's where you're going, this is not where I would begin. So I ask myself a question as a welcome guest here and an honored guest asked quite some months back as Pastor Steve had written to me and asked me, where do I begin? How do I help navigate with the primary message that I would like to leave for you tonight? So let me begin with a story that I have never ever begun my messages with. I've told it in different contexts, but I've never begun a message with this. So I'd like you to follow me. It came years ago in the Reader's Digest, and it was called, It Happened on the Brooklyn Subway. It's a true story of a man by the name of Marcel Sternberger, who used to take a certain train every morning to go to work. But he'd heard a friend of his was very critically ill, put into hospital, and Marcel decided to go in that direction, visit him, spend the morning with him, because he's not sure he'd have much of time with him beyond that. At about noon, he got into a train that he'd never been on before, because he was always at work in another part of town. And as he walked into the train, it was lunch hour, so it was crowded. He didn't think he'd get a seat. But he saw a man sitting there next to him, another individual, snug tight. But as soon as the doors were shortly about to close, the man next to him stood up and bolted out of the train when he realized this was his station. And Sternberger made a beeline for that vacant spot and sat there. Only it was very uncomfortable because the man next to him was reading a Hungarian newspaper. So Sternberger looked at him, trying to make conversation, hoping he'll fold up the paper and said, are you Hungarian? He said, yes. He said, I notice you're reading, reading the classified ads. He said, that is correct. He said, are you looking for a job? He said, no, sir, I'm actually looking for my wife. Sternberger was rather startled, wondering if he was looking for a matrimonial column or what. And he said, tell me about it. He said, you know, I come from Debrecen in Hungary. Many years ago, we were there during the war, and I was taken away by the Russians to go and bury the dead. During that time, we had been invaded, but the Americans and Canadians had come in, and they rescued most of the people from there. Although my wife had possibly been taken to Auschwitz, I was hoping somehow that she was found and brought to America, very much alive here. Sternberger's wheels started to turn in his mind, and he thought to himself, where have I heard this story before? somebody from Debrecen whose husband had been taken by the Russians to bury the dead. She had gone into Auschwitz. She had been rescued and brought here to the United States. And then he remembered he'd been at a gathering at a party a few weeks before where the woman next to him had told him that story, that she came from Debrecen. Her husband had been taken away and uh, filling him in all the blanks. He thought to himself, wow, is this the connection? But he didn't want to say anything. But he dipped into his wallet and pulled out a dog-eared piece of paper because he had taken down the woman's name and phone number and said, I hope sometime we can get together. You're a stranger here in New York and so on. Took all the details and he looked at her name and then he looked at this man next to him and he said, what's your wife's name? He said, my wife's name is Maria Paskin. And he looked at the paper, it was Maria Paskin. He said, and what is your name? He said, my name is Bella Paskin. He said, Mr. Paskin, would you please get off the next station with me? I want to make a telephone call for you. So he walks into the telephone booth, dials the number, and after several rings, it's picked up, and Sternberger says, who am I speaking to? And she says, this is Maria. He says, Maria, do you remember me, Marcel Sternberger? We met several weeks ago. She said, yes, I remember you. He said, Maria, what was your husband's name? He said, my husband's name was Bella Paskin. 
So he called this man into the telephone booth, took the telephone and gave it to Bella Paskin and said, Mr. Paskin, you are about to witness the greatest miracle of your life. And he stepped out, giving him some money to take a taxi and go and meet the wife that he had lost many years ago. The article ends by saying, some people might think it was purely coincidental that I'd gone to visit a sick friend that morning. Others may think it was coincidental that I happened to step into this train. Still others would say that the person sitting next to this individual reading the newspaper stepped out just at the time. Coincidentally, I sat next to him. All of this could be seen as coincidence by somebody, he said. But is it possible that God rode the Brooklyn subway that afternoon? You and I go through life time and time again, especially when the trials are deep and the testing of our souls is intense. And at the moment we are going through it, we ask ourselves the question, how can this be happening to me? Why are we facing such things? Why such strong hostility, antagonism, whatever you may be going through, either personally or as a family or as a group? And then the years go by and you look at the unfolding pattern and you see how the grand weaver had everything to do with the design and pull together the threads to make you into the person that he intended you to be. We often think we are the ones facing the stiffest challenges in the history of the church. Simply not true. You go back across history and you see how tense it has been for the church many, many times. And that's exactly what Martin Luther said. And though this world with devils filled will threaten to undo us, we will not fear for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, and lo, his doom is sure. One little word will fell him. We saw that during the Reformation. We see it time and again across church history. And I just want to say to you that it started right from the days of the early church. And I want to read for you a passage and bring to you the message that I'm entitling, Convictions That Conquered the World. Convictions That Conquered the World. But may I just give you one key idea here. What is a conviction? A conviction is very different to an opinion. An opinion is something you have in a continuum of options. You may have the opinion for yourself that you prefer blue to green that you prefer this kind of food to that kind of food. You prefer this kind of architecture to that kind of architecture. These are the opinions we have and the preferences we talk about. And it's possible 10 years down the line, you may change your opinion, which is okay. You may prefer another color to the, the one you first did. But a conviction is something very different to an opinion. An opinion is something you have. A conviction is something that has you. It holds you. It, it is what motivates you. It is those imperatives within your soul. And you can never change a conviction without changing who you are. And it is your convictions that will ultimately drive you through life, especially through the toughest seasons of the soul. What you feel deeply as a conviction will carry you through. Your opinions may change, but your convictions you cannot change without changing yourself. What were the convictions that carried the early church, especially when they were facing the martyrdom of one of their choicest young men? I'm reading the closing verses of Acts chapter 7. It is purposely positioned in this way, both in the chronological order of the book of Acts and in the logical order of what had happened when our Lord himself stood before the Sanhedrin. He used certain words at that time. Stephen now is standing before <coughs> the Sanhedrin. When they heard this, they were furious 
and they gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he said this, he fell asleep. And the first verse of the next chapter, and Saul was there giving approval to his death. The great American poet James Russell Lowell wrote these words. Once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in the strife of truth with falsehood for the good or evil side. With each choice God speaking to us offers then the bloom or blight then the man or nation chooses for the darkness or the light. It is the same James Russell Lowell who said, truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne, but the scaffold sways the future, and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadows, keeping watch, keeping watch over his own. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne, but the scaffold sways the future, and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadows, keeping watch, keeping watch over his own. We must understand how God has guarded his word and his people through history. Samuel Taylor Coleridge, the romantic poet, said this about history. If men could only learn from history what lessons it might teach us, but passion and party blind our eyes, and the light which experience gives us is a lantern on the stern which signs, shines only on the waves behind us. So often we learn by mistakes and looking back, and the lantern on the stern points out to us what actually happened. I'm a Christian apologist. By that I mean we answer people's questions. It is a time in which the questions have changed. Once upon a time, they were cerebrally driven, rigorously intellectual, and you had to be well prepared to be able to argue your position with love and grace. All of a sudden, the questions have shifted. It's no longer just intellectual questions. They are densely textured societal and cultural questions. And one wrong word, one wrong step can land you into a minefield that can be devastating. How we answer, how we present is equally important as what we answer and what we present. What we say is the message how we say it is the method. And if the world rejects either one out of the two, you have lost the questioner in the process. We are really answering questioners. We are not so much answering questions. And our Lord was brilliant at this, so brilliant. And that's why every time he was questioned, he questioned his questioner. Because when you question your questioner, it opens up the questioner in two ways. It opens them up within their own assumptions. And number two, it determines the entry point of the discussion. So how we view history, how we see the topography that has gone behind us, how we see God works in certain patterns is critical for the future. And I want to present to you three very simple truths of how the early church faced the storms and challenges, how it was that a handful of people, a fraction of a minority in the culture of their time, was able to change the world for millennia to come. Think about it. Just a handful at the ascension. And yet, today, no, but no name is bent before in its knees than the name of Jesus more than any other name. 
How did this happen? How were they able to conquer the known world of their time with this many ideas? Here's the first. They saw the finger of God in all of history and Christ as its central figure. To use the terminology of theology, he was the hermeneutical centerpiece. Because of him, the interpretation could be understood. Or to use the philosophical term, the epistemological centerpiece, how you know what is true. So both truth and interpretation to the early church was seen through the lens of the person of Jesus Christ. Think of the convergence of cultures at that time. And it's very little different in ours. To the Jewish mind, it was tradition, tradition, tradition. If you have seen the play Fiddler on the Roof, it talks about tradition being as tenuous as a fiddler on the roof, but it's tradition, tradition, tradition. And when the children start to make decisions, that's not in keeping with the family. Remember Tevye's words, on the one hand, on the other hand, on the one hand, on the other hand, on the one hand, and then there is no other hand, he says. First you bend this way, then you bend that way, and he comes up with, how far can you bend without breaking? For them it was tradition, tradition, tradition. That's exactly what Stephen is pointing them to. Look back, look back. He is asked a simple question by the Sanhedrin. First verse, and over 50 verses are his answer. One verse, what do you have to say about these charges against you? He goes all the way back to the time of Abraham. Abraham, Moses, through the law, through the prophets, through the kings, everything. And then he brings them back to that present moment and takes them into the future. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. But for the Hebrew mind, it was tradition. For the, for the uh, utopianist, it's always the future, pie in the sky, by and by, when I die. If you talk to an average Marxist today and think of all of the suffering inflicted upon millions of people, whether in Russia or China, and see the enslavement of the wills of the masses, what is their philosophy? Pie in the sky, by and by, when I die. One day, one day, one day, one day. So the traditionalist looks to the past, the utopianist looks to the future. The existentialist lives for the moment, trying to pull themselves up by their volitional bootstraps to conquer against the face of despair and somehow will to have meaning. Will to have meaning against despair. Tradition, utopianism, for the now with emotion. Jesus walking on the road to Emmaus with two disciples. They have no clue who he is. They are crestfallen, brokenhearted. All they can remember is Calvary. And he looks at them and says, what are you boys talking about? And they look at him and say, are you the only one in Israel who doesn't know what's happened? Ironically, he was the only one in Israel who did know what had happened. <laughs> so he begins again to tell them historically all that the prophets had said. You know, I want to tell you something. Our Lord preached magnificent sermons. The Sermon on the Mount is that quintessential masterpiece. But if you were to give me a choice which I would hate to make, if you ask me which is the one sermon you would like to have heard from the lips of our Lord, this would be the one in Luke 24. Because he takes them across the whole sweep of history their hearts begin to burn within them saying, we've never, ever connected the dots like this. And so they look at him and say, we'll pay for your dinner. Will you come in and eat with us? It's amazing what happens. Just follow me. They've heard all this stuff. They're trying to process it. He sits across a table, takes a piece of bread, breaks it. They saw one person do that before. 
the way he broke it. And what did he say? As often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, now you proclaim the Lord's death in the past until he come in the future. In that simple pronouncement for the Lord's Supper, he gave all of history meaning. Every moment. Tradition is important. Don't ever forget it. The future is critical. Move in the right way. But harness the moment. It can also be one that can either move you to the right or to the wrong. We are living in that moment in history where so much is happening, ladies and gentlemen, and I know the decisions are not easy. I'm, I was born in India, moved to Canada, and now live in the United States. I have the confluence of three great cities in my life, New Delhi, Toronto, and now Atlanta. I feel like a citizen of the world. And as I travel around, I'm as home in Singapore or Delhi as I am in Atlanta or New York or here in Dallas. I love I love the peoples of the world, but I see things happening and we are struggling to know how to interpret them. One of the things that happening, and I know there's no simple answer, there's no simple answer. I am aware of the difficulties, very aware. But these are moments that may not come again. What do I mean? In the 70s and 80s, I used to speak a lot in Lebanon. My close friend there is a man by the name of Sammy Dagger. You may have never heard the name, but if you think back upon observing the funeral of Billy Graham, one of the speakers for that five-minute slot was Sammy Dagger from Beirut. Sammy was influential in reading Frank, leading Franklin to the Lord. Sammy Dagger was a maitre d' when he saw Franklin coming there night after night when his life was all lost. And Sammy was so instrumental in bringing him to Christ. Sammy became a minister and is still so active in all over the Middle East, he's a, he, he packs more energy into saying good morning than most of us would in a whole sermon, full of energy. And once when I was uh, somewhere in the 70s or 80s, I was with him in his van, which moved more by prayer than any mechanical capability under the hood. And so we are driving, and Sammy doesn't know any fear. When people found out I was traveling around with Sammy, they prayed harder for me. At the back of his bumper he, bumper, he had the sticker, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And I said to him, don't you think it'll be better to mail this verse than put this on the back and drive through the area as you go? He started laughing. So we're driving, chugging along, and all of a sudden a group of Syrian soldiers surround us. And they ask us to lower the windows. I said, that's it. I'm going to be buried right here with all of the cedars of Lebanon, and their windows were down, and their guns, one on my window, one on his, closer than I'd ever seen a barrel. And then they look at Sammy and say to him, do you have any explosives, any dynamite in this van? He said, yes. <laughs> this van is full of dynamite. I thought, what is the matter with this guy? <laughs> then he puts his hand out under the tarp, takes out a red New Testament and says to this man, here is the dynamite. It's not the kind that will hurt. I have one for each of you. And he started to pull it out. They figured they'd had enough of him. So they started to talk to me, which was, they say, Hindu, which is Arabic for Indian. At that point, I was willing to say yes to anything. I said, yes, I, 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 I'm, I'm from India. Then he stood back, clicked his heels, saluted, and said, Indira Gandhi Mubarak. Give my greetings to Indira Gandhi. As of Indira Gandhi and I played marbles together. <laughs> I said, I'll be sure to take your greetings to Indira Gandhi. <laughs> and then we, they told us to move on. Sammy chugs along and stops, and here's what he said to me. He said, Brother Rafi, for years and years and years, I have prayed that Syria would open her doors to the gospel, so difficult for missionaries to get in there. He said, and you know what? I am puzzled now. We have 
thousands of Syrian soldiers here in Beirut, and I'm so angry that they're taking my country and my culture away from me. So I got on my knees to complain to the Lord, why are you doing this? This is the pearl of the Middle East, the most beautiful part in this part of the world. The only place where, at least in theory, the Christian faith is a majority in Lebanon. Why are you doing this to us? He said, on my knees I was complaining and I sensed the Lord saying to me, Sammy, for years you've been asking me and complaining to me that Syria doesn't allow any missionaries within her borders. And now I have sent 50,000 Syrians to you and you are still complaining to me. Think of America today, people from all over the world, all over the world whom he has brought to our doorstep. We were in a man Jordan a few weeks ago, my colleagues and I, on a midweek, the place is jam-packed. You cannot get a seat with Iraqi or Syrian refugees who would never probably walk into a church, but they are now threadbare. They are broken. They've got nothing to call their own. And there's tens of thousands of them. One of the Jordanians said to me, we are suffering from compassion fatigue. But as we were sitting around lunch listening to them, we could tell you story after story after story, story how the Syrians, how the Iraqis are responding to the gospel for the first time and they've had the opportunity. I have heard it said, I've not been able to confirm it. I've not been able to confirm it that the second fastest growing church in the world today is in Iran. Even if it's the fifth or sixth or seventh or tenth, it's a miracle in our times when the finger of God is in all of history When the finger of God is in all of history, he moves peoples. He moves them in masses. He has brought them to your doorstep and mine. Can we see it through the lens of Jesus, who's probably saying to you and to me, child of God, you don't have to go 10,000 miles away anymore. I'm bringing the masses to you. And they know how to endure suffering. They know how to endure deprivation. You go to Mosul today, it's like a graveyard city. The houses are decimated. But they are finding their home in Jesus Christ. The finger of God in all of history and Christ as its central figure. That's the first truth I want to leave with you. The second I leave with you is how they harnessed an arena of persecution and transformed it into a platform of opportunity. How they harnessed an arena of persecution and transformed it into a platform of opportunity. Think of that. I remember years ago when I first met Christ and I came to him on a bed of suicide. I was a despairing young man, age 17, with no hope. In the last week, two great celebrities have taken their lives. One a fashion designer, one a celebrity chef. And as soon as I read a story like that, I move back over half a century and think what happens when there's the death of hope. It's the hope for death. If Christ hadn't rescued me, I would have been in the same place. But because he took me that way through the dark waters, when a young man comes up to the microphone now and asks a question about the meaning of life and what his or her life really means, I get the feeling of goosebumps all over my being because I know how genuine that question is for the masses of them. They are desperately looking for meaning. I don't know what God has poured into your life in way of suffering and pain. Every one of those blows, every one of those injuries is for a purpose. And when the church goes through the headwinds 
and a huge storm, and you're clinging on for dear life, wondering how we are going to get through this. It is for a purpose that God has for you and me, not only to examine ourselves, but also to move forward with the confidence we've been through this before. He changes an arena of pain into a platform of opportunity. Think of the great hymn writers, Fanny Crosby, Annie Johnston, Flynn Flint, George Matheson, the great hymn writer, George Matheson, who, who tragically went blind when he was 20. He was only 10 when he began to lose his eyesight. At age 20, he was completely blind. And his fiancée said, I truly don't think I can have the courage and strength to walk through life with you as a blind man. He had already, he was beginning to study at the University of Glasgow, went to the Scotland Seminary there, studied a brilliant mind. His sister learned Hebrew, Greek, and Latin to read to him the great classics and the scriptures. And then a few years went by, and he was hit hard when his sister said, George, I am going to get married, and we are going to live elsewhere. I don't know how you're going to do this from here on. It crushed him, crushed him, but he understood it. The night before her wedding, he sat down with a pen and paper in hand, and under 10 minutes he wrote that immortal hymn, O love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee, that in life's ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. O joy that seekest me through pain, it cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain and feel the promise is not vain that morn shall tearless be. Under 10 minutes, and he never edited it. Take a look at that hymn sometime, Oh, love that will not let me go. It was written by a blind man who just lost his last pair of eyes. Annie Johnston Flint, orphaned, cancerous, rheumatoid arthritis, diapers for most of her life most of her life as she was incontinent eight pillows cushioning her battered body she writes he giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater he sendeth more strength when the labors increase to added affliction he addeth his mercy to multiplied trials his multiplied peace when we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving has only begun. His love has no limit, his grace has no measure, his power has no boundaries known unto men, for out of his infinite riches in Jesus he giveth and giveth and giveth again. Extraordinary, extraordinary an arena of persecution into a platform of opportunity. I don't know what you're going through in your personal life. We all go through the dark nights of the soul. We all do. What has stopped surprising me anymore, I'm now 72 years old, is as I talk to people, how many have gone through a lot of pain? How many go through a lot of grief? The famed preacher, Dr. Jowett, said, if you preach to a hurting people, you will never lack for an audience. If you preach to a hurting people, you will never lack for an audience. How critical it is that when we go through pain, that we understand God has a pattern and a program to bring us through for the purposes that he has in mind. Let me read for you what the scriptures say. What more shall I say in Hebrews 11:32 to 40? I do not have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets 
who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us they might be made perfect. Our Lord himself came to that critical moment before Calvary. And as his soul was exceedingly troubled, and he goes over to the disciples, this is the Lord of the universe, looks at the disciples and says, could you not wait with me these few moments here? I've needed you. And then as he prays and he says, Father, if there's any way for this cup to pass from me, not my will, yours be done. I sometimes think about the cross and shut my eyes and try to see the cruel nails, the crown of thorns, and Jesus crucified for me. But even could I see him die, I would but see a little part of that great love which, like a fire, is always burning in his heart cross, the message of the gospel, only you and I have it, is the message of the cross. When I say you and I, those who are followers of Jesus, there is no other faith in the world that has the cross. That's why there's no other faith in the world that talks about salvation as a gift. It's only the faith in Christ that has salvation as a gift. It's the gift of grace, how God moves us through an arena of persecution, making it into a platform of opportunity. I want to read this for you, and I want you to listen to me very carefully. It's one of the most beautiful paragraphs ever in theological writ. It is written by the Scotsman James Stewart, who is one of my great heroes in writing taught at Edinburgh for years. In his book, The Strong Name, listen to this. He's discussing the verse and what it means he led captivity captive. He led captivity captive. He said, what does that mean? Here's what he says. It is a glorious phrase. He led captivity captive. The very triumphs of his foes, it means he used for their defeat. He compelled their dark achievements to subserve his ends, not theirs. They nailed him to the tree, not knowing by that very act they were bringing the world to his feet. They gave him a cross, not guessing that he would make it a throne. They flung him outside the gates to die, not knowing in that very moment they were lifting up all the gates of the universe to let the king of glory come in. They thought to root out his doctrines, not understanding that they were implanting imperishably in the hearts of men the very name they intended to destroy. They thought they had God with his back to the wall, pinned and helpless and defeated. They did not know it was God himself who had tracked them down to that point. To that point. He did not conquer in spite of the dark mystery of evil. He conquered through it. He did not conquer in spite of the dark mystery of evil. He conquered through it. Here's a secular writer, Will Durant. There is no greater drama in human record than the sight of a few Christians scorned or oppressed by a succession of emperors, bearing all trials with a fierce tenacity, multiplying quietly, building order while the enemies generated chaos, fighting the sword with the word, brutality with hope, and at last defeating the strongest state that history has ever known. Caesar and Christ had met in the arena, and Christ had won. 
Caesar and Christ had met in the arena, and Christ had won. How they changed that arena, arena of persecution and transformed it into a platform of opportunity. Years ago, I was speaking in Poland during the days of the Cold War. I was in a little town called Jingalov, and we'd driven to that spot and nearly 3,000, 2,500 to 3,000 people sitting in that tent. This in the 80s. And as I was standing behind that pulpit, I was looking at a banner. It said, Christusem Inace, Christusem Inace. So I looked at the doctor who had invited me and I said, what does that mean? He said, it's very hard to translate. The only way you could understand it if you understand Polish history. We have suffered so much, but Christ. We have been persecuted, but Christ. We have had oppressors in our land, but Christ. Christusem inace, but Christ, but Christ, but Christ. And as we go through the testings, just remember those two words, but Christ, but Christ. How we can change an arena of persecution into a platform of opportunities. Number one, how they saw the finger of God in all of history and Christ as the central figure. Number two, how they harnessed an arena of persecution, transformed it into a platform of opportunity. Lastly, and very critically and beautifully here, the priority of a person over methodology. We may think of all the methods in the world, God's method has always been a person. Always been a person. I remember when we lost Chuck Colson. What a huge loss. I don't know how many times a week I think about Chuck and miss him for such a time as this. A few months ago, we lost R.C. Spro, And then Billy Graham. These great personalities who came across the landscape of time and God called them home. Think of the impact. No single human being had the kind of impact that Billy Graham did. A simple farm boy. The Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. The world hears that voice when you see him in the videos of from the 50s and 60s. It's spellbinding. God's anointing was so richly upon him. You know, I look at the scriptures and I see myself wondering, why did Joseph not write a book on 50 typical dreams and how to interpret them? Why did Moses not open his own Bush University? <laughs> Samson autographing jawbones everywhere he went. Jonah speaking on 50 photographs from inside of a whale and how to use them in evangelism. <laughs> David issuing slings to the whole army. No sir, no ma'am. God raises up a voice. God raises up a pen, and God changes history. On the 45th anniversary of Youth for Christ, I was in Chicago, and it was a tribute to those who had founded it, including Billy Graham. And Tory Johnson was just a few weeks away from his own passing. He stood up and talked about when he was a younger man. He was to speak in a school. I think it was Chicago but he couldn't go, so he phoned a young evangelist by the name of Billy Graham and asked him if he would go and take his place. So he phoned the school and said, I can't come, but there's a young guy by the name of Billy Graham. He's gonna take my place. They said, we don't want him. We want you. He said, you like him. They said, we don't want him, never heard of him. He said, believe me, you would like him. If you don't like him, I will, I will make it up to you. I can't come, have this man called Billy Graham. So Billy goes and speaks, finishes the meeting and comes back. And he contacts Tori and Tori says, how did it go? He said, not very well. He said, nobody came to know the Lord? He said, no, actually one person did. He said, really? He said, yeah, one young man and I prayed with him. He said, Billy, did you write down his name so you can pray for him? He said, yes. He said, give me that name, I'll pray for him too. So he opened his book there and he said, the name is Warren Wearsby. 
and Warren Wearsby was sitting right on the platform there. One young man, one message, an expositor is born. I just say to you, never lose hope. There will never be another Billy Graham, but God will raise up somebody that Billy Graham could never have been. It's true. We see this again and again and again. So Stephen is being martyred. It's ironic what he says. You know what he says? I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. The last time they had heard it in the Gospels, Jesus had said to the Sanhedrin, I will be ascending to my Father and sitting at the right hand of my Father, and I will come from heaven in the cloud, over the clouds and so on. Now he says he sees the Son of Man standing. Why? I strongly suspect he's getting up to welcome the hero. Say, welcome, Stephen. Welcome. I prepared the place for you. Well done. The church was on the verge of despair. There was another man celebrating in triumph. He did not know it was going to be he that God had in mind to write one-third of the New Testament. Saul of Tarsus to the Apostle Paul. He'd come to murder people, now he was hunted himself. And he gave us the Book of Romans among so many others. John Wesley walks into an Aldersgate meeting and somebody is reading a commentary from Martin Luther as a preface to the Book of Romans. Wesley's heart is strangely warmed. Luther himself, struggling, reads the book of Romans. Augustine, debauched in his sin, and he hears the words, telolege, and the words from Romans comes to him, not in rioting or drunkenness, not in chambering or wantonness, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh thereof. The one man who was overseeing the murder of Stephen wrote for us the scriptures that has influenced and changed history and he's one of the most beloved names in Christendom today. I don't know how many of you young people are seated here. But let me tell you something. God can use you, young woman. God can use you, young man. He can change your heart and put a new song in your heart put a pen in your hand and make a difference for history. You may be in the audience today through whom God is going to chart a course for the future. Never underestimate that. Chooses individuals to change the course of history. And as I see the convictions, the finger of God in all of history and Christ as its central figure, an arena of persecution into a platform of opportunity, how they saw the priority of a person over methodology. I just want to close very quickly with a simple story. In 1939, the world was on the edge of one of the bloodiest and most senseless wars ever fought. Tens of thousands were going to be killed, sometimes thousands in a day, as the Third Reich was going to raise its venom against the free world. And the amazing thing at that time was everybody is looking for a leader. People forget that on Christmas Day in 1939, King George VI, who had a stuttering problem, went to the microphone to speak to the world. And as he was heading to the microphone, his 12-year-old daughter, the present queen, gave him a piece of paper. And on that paper, she had these words written, 
I said to the man at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may walk safely into the unknown. He said to me, go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. It shall be to you better than the light and safer than the known. I said to the man at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may walk safely into the unknown. He said to me, go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. It shall be to you better than the light and safer than the known. A 12-year-old girl gave those words to her father. People don't remember anything about that speech, but they remember those words. Let's go out into the darkness and put our hand into the hand of God. It shall be to you better than the light and safer than the known. How do you put your hand into the hand of God? The only way I know is by holding his word in your hands for his scriptures cannot be broken. Thy word is truth. Heaven and earth may pass away, but your word abides forever. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't thank you enough for giving me the honor of speaking to you. And Pastor Steve, thank you so much for giving me this privilege of speaking to this grand conference. May God bless you and use you for his glory.